Greetings, my dear viewers. It is I, Drehan, and welcome back to the 100 subscriber special, A Raw Guide to Home Brewery. <clears throat> Today we are taking a look at the next chapter in the home brew series, Creating a Race or Subrace. This one is actually pretty interesting as I'm sure a lot of people have thought about creating their own race. And today we are going to go over the steps of doing so. Now before we do, uh, one thing I want to take a look at is creating your own race. And well, there are some limitations to what you want to do. Uh, much like I said in the very first video of this series, you want to be careful on what you create, and if possible, just reskin certain elements that already exist. For example, say I want an elf that lives on the sun. Then, in all honesty, I'm just going to be using a summer Eladrin for that particular race, because they already have a lot of elements that are the same as what I'm wanting for this type of elf. And if I wanted a little bit more from this race, then I'm just going to take a stab at Teldori Reborn and fuse the Summer Eladrin with Fire Genasi elements, since it has other features that I might want out of this race that I couldn't get with the Eladrin otherwise. So that's something to think about. Just take a look at what all is already available to you and just reskin it or reflavor it. In fact, one of the steps that it says that you can do is just taking a race that exists and just changing its religious outlook or changing how it functions socially, like uh, for example, dwarves being miners to uh, cowboys or something. Sailors is what it gives the example for in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Just small, minute changes like that can go a long way. Now, for the actual book itself, the Dungeon Master Guide gives us a list of things to go over before we actually create this race for real. So here are the steps that you need to take, or at least the guidelines. For the first question, why does my campaign need this race to be playable? A very standard question. Uh, why does this creature need to exist? Why should it be playable? Why does the world need this creature? What does the race look like? Give a small description of what this creature might look like. Very simple stuff. How do I describe the race's culture? Culture is very important. It's much like in today's society with our different ethnicities, we also have different cultural backgrounds that are very important. It helps distinguish us from one another. Are there any interesting conflicts built into the race's history and culture that make the race compelling from a storytelling standpoint? Once again, taking us humans into example, we seem to have a lot of conflict within our past and within our culture as well. Even though our culture isn't as interesting, at least from a historical standpoint, if we're talking about just the American history, if we're talking about something like Chinese history or Japanese history, then we have some interesting stories. What is the race's relationship to the other playable races? 
How does it interact with, say, a turtle? How does it interact with the halflings, the humans? Is there some form of conflict between them? Something that makes an interaction with another race interesting. What classes and backgrounds are well suited to the members of the race? Whoa there, that is a lot. That's a video in of itself. So we're not going to bother with that. I might take a look at that another day. Uh, I can't exactly wink at you guys, so just pretend that an, a set of eyes is winking at you. Okay, next is what are the race's signature traits? Simple enough, but I'd be able to distinguish it from another race. In case of a new subrace, what sets it apart from other subraces of the parent race? So, like, say, a high elf and a drow, or the Aladrin and the Shadakai, how does it differ? What makes it unique? On page 286 of the Dungeon Master's Guide, we have the following text. When creating a race from scratch, begin with the story and proceed from there. Compare your creation to the other races of your world and borrow freely from the traits of other races. So, like, say you're wanting to make, I don't know, an illithid race. Use features from other races. So, like, the lizard folk's bite or the dragonborn's breath weapon just changed out for psychic damage and there is your brain blast, or psionic blast, rather. Something like that, borrowing things from other races. Don't make things overpowered, just take a couple of things here and there that make sense for that race. Now, for a base, I would say use the custom lineage as a starting point for your race. Your creature type, your size, your speed, what traits it might have, optional proficiencies, and of course racial features. For our example on creating a player race, I'm going to use one that already exists. Well, sort of. On the Dungeon Master's Guide on page 282, we actually have a list of NPC racial features. And for our example, I'm actually going to use the Kuatoa, which honestly should be a player race because they are so darn funny. I mean, they're meant to be creepy, but they are hilarious. They're just reverse mermaid. Human body, fish head. It's hilarious. I love them. I actually am currently playing a Kuatoa cleric using these features that I'm about to show you. I have named him Gloop Gloop. He is just hilarious. Uh, v, how about you demonstrate how Gloop Gloop talks? All right. He talks like this. I'm just using my finger and going up and down on my lips. So it looks like this. I'm so like I am talking like this. It's hilarious. We love it. But anyway, enough of how we like to play the Kuatoa. Let's talk about how the Kuatoa functions as a playable character. First and more, foremost, the creature type. Kuatoa, according to the Monster Manual, are humanoid. Their size is medium. They're roughly the same size as a human, but maybe a bit smaller, just slightly taller than a dwarf, I would say. Their walking speed is 30 feet, and they have a swimming speed of 30 feet. For their traits, they have dark vision of 120 feet. They have some racial features as well. Amphibious, they can breathe air and water. They have otherworldly perception. And this feature is really cool. They know that there's an invisible creature in the area. They don't know 
where it is until it starts moving, and they don't know what it looks like. It's still invisible, but they know that there is something there. Something that I imagine for a Kuatoa encounter is your party decides to do a stealth mission. Everybody's invisible. And they walk into a chamber that they hear chanting from. And there's a bunch of Kuatoa. The arms raised, going up and down as they're chanting to a statue of their god. As the players stop, so does the chanting. The Kuatoa's arms lower. And suddenly, the Kuatoa's attention and their heads snap towards the entrance of the chamber. They know that you are here, and since this is the only entrance to the chamber, they know where you are. Their unblinking eyes staring at you. And that is actually the next feature I want to go over. The sunlight sensitivity. They have unblinking eyes. So if they were on the surface in daylight, they would most definitely have a problem with the sun. And I really do like the sunlight sensitivity as a feature that would be a detriment to the Kuatoa. And it makes sense. Another feature they have is slippery. This just gives them a bonus to breaking, break free from a grapple, which isn't exactly that useful, but it is there. And of course, because of the new Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, all races that have been released after that book now have either a plus two to one ability score and a plus one to another ability score, or have one ability score increase for three ability scores. So yeah, that is how you create a new player race within Dungeons and Dragons. I'll see you all next time when we cover how to create new class options. Until then, this has been Drehan, and I am offline.